And there were three women, three Irish women, who were kneeling in the fields looking at the sun. And they were saying, oh, look, the sun is spinning. Can you see it? Can you see it? And I said to them, well, you know, if you look at the sun for long enough, the sun is going to spin. So I came to Medjugorje on my own. I was 16. I knew no one uh, at the time from the point of view of Ireland. Uh, this was Yugoslavia. It was communist. It was behind the Iron Curtain. My parents were very, very worried at the idea that I would um, come here on my own. My father had been asked for his work one time to come here, but he was too frightened to come. So it was, uh, they were very worried that now their 16 year old son, second youngest of seven children, that I was coming here on my own and I knew no one, but I came and I'm glad I came. But the week that I was here completely changed everything for me. It, it turned my life upside down or turned my life right side up, one or the other, but it completely changed me. When my parents collected me in Dublin airport, when I came home, I remember saying to them that God and Mary were so real in Medjugorje that I felt that if I reached out my hand, I could touch them. It was that sense of God being real and tangible and alive. A few weeks after I came back from Medjugorje, um, I was in the church the, for Sunday mass, the reading the gospel reading was the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And as soon as the priest read that line where, he, where the disciples say, did not our hearts burn within us as he walked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us, that are exactly articulated for me what happened to me in Medjugorje. Because when people were coming here and they were saying um, there was a great sense of peace, for me, peace was almost too passive a word to describe my experience here. So that, uh, that wording, you know, did not our heart burn within us as he walked with us on the road. That was what I experienced here in Medjugorje. My, I remember the, the first Sunday after I came back from Medjugorje, going to my local church for Sunday mass with my brother. And as we walked into the church, uh, and this, this is a true story. My brother said to me, Rory, Rory, please stop that. And I said, stop what? And he said, look, you know what you're doing. Please stop. It's very embarrassing. And I said, Shawnee, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, stop smiling at everyone. But I, I wasn't even aware that I was doing this. I just carried home from Medjugorje this profound sense of joy. Um this profound sense of joy in the presence of God and that sense of being known by God and loved by God. And that's, that's what that first time was for me. When I came back from Medjugorje the first time, I just wanted to go back as soon as I could. So I went back. My first time was April, Easter, and then I came back the following October. I told everyone about Medjugorje. I'm sure it was the most annoying thing for them because I couldn't talk about anything else. Uh, my parents were the next to come. They came very soon after. And over the years, all my family have come to Medjugorje. Uh, my decision to become a priest is very much connected here with Medjugorje. In that first time that I was here, Our Lady was appearing in the, the, the parish office up the stairs. And each night the people would gather uh, outside the parish office and we'd pray the rosary and a light would go on in the room to indicate that Our Lady was now appearing. And on one of those days, one of the women on our group came to me after the apparition and she was crying and she said, Rory, I need to tell you something. During the apparition, I glanced over at you and she said, all of a sudden, everything else was blacked out but you were like in a circle of light. And she said, I heard a voice that said, Rory is going to be a priest. Now, when I was growing up, priests were very much uh, on a pedestal. The idea that I might be called to the priesthood, I could never have accepted that. I had a desire for priesthood, but I 
could never accept that God would call me to priesthood because I had such an exalted uh, sense of the priesthood. So this was a very, very powerful experience in my life. When I came back the following October, I was walking through the fields at the back of the church one day, one evening, and there were three women, three Irish women, who were kneeling in the fields looking at the sun. And they were saying, oh, look, the sun is spinning. Can you see it? Can you see it? And I said to them, well, you know, if you look at the sun for long enough, the sun is going to spin. But one of the women was extremely angry with me, very, very angry. And she gave out to me and she was she was very, very angry. And later that night, one of the other two women said to me, did this woman catch up with you? She was she wanted to speak with you. And I presumed that maybe she wanted to apologize because her her um, her words were over the top. But I said, no, I haven't seen her yet. And they said, well, look, can you meet her tomorrow after mass? Because she really needs to speak to you. So after mass the next day, I met her and she took me aside and she said, um, Rory, you made me so angry yesterday. And when you walked away, I was saying in my own mind, why do people like that come to Medjugorje if they have no faith? And she said to me, and I heard a very distinct voice that said, but he is going to be a priest. So that was the second time that that was confirmed for me. So eventually I was ordained on the 20th of June, 1998, which was two very important feast days combined. It was the feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So, and I didn't choose the date. My bishop chose the date. And he didn't know it was this feast day. But I felt it was Our Lady showing that she, that her Immaculate Heart was, was, would triumph in my life because of all the difficulties on the way through uh, my journey to priesthood. It was also the Feast of the Irish Martyrs who were very important uh, in my spiritual life as well. And my first parish was to the only church in Ireland, which is the Church of the Irish Martyrs. So, uh, so Medjugorje has been so, so important to me in, in my journey to priesthood and since also. It was beautiful this morning at Mass. The main celebrant was a young priest, two years ordained, Father David Vard. And he said to the people, he said, I came here first when I was 17 and this priest brought me here. So it, it was beautiful for me because when he was 17, I, I saw myself. I saw myself, and it was beautiful to see him say Mass in Medjugorje this, this morning. What always impresses me about Medjugorje is that in the end of the day, Medjugorje is a parish. So it operates like, a, like, like any other parish, and it has the same um, schedule and functions of any other parish. But what perhaps is only half-heartedly attended in our parishes back at home here is very much alive. So the experience of, of Eucharistic adoration for people, and many people when they go home, they, they point to it as being a highlight of their, their time here in Medjugorje. Many people who perhaps have never in the past really um, thought about the fact that Jesus is really present in the Eucharist. During adoration here, the, the, the truth of that uh, teaching of our faith becomes so real for them. And when we come to Mass, the sheer volume of people's responses. People, you know, Our Lady asked us here to live the Mass. And people really live the Mass here. They really pray the Mass here in, in Medjugorje. So that is hugely um, significant and moving for people who come. I remember one um, young man who, who we brought here a few years ago. And he said to me um, that every time he received communion here, he'd go back to his seat and he'd find himself the tears welling up in his eyes. And he said, you know, that, that never happened to me anywhere else. And I was explaining to him, you know, that, the, that the, the sense of God is so strong here, the faith of the people is so strong, and it cannot but touch us when we, when we gather here. Just that reality of Jesus is, is alive, that he's present, and that he comes to us in the Eucharist. Very, very important thing is... The sincerity of the guides who minister to us here in Medjugorje. 
their, um, their sincerity, their sense of vocation in their own life. That is very, very significant. The prayer in Medjugorje, prayer is just so much taken for granted. You know, that we start everything with prayer, that we, we finish everything with prayer, that there is so much prayer. That's very, very significant also. We need to be a praying church. And that's what's coming from Medjugorje, that um, constant message to be a people of prayer. She says that prayer is the foundation of our peace. Prayer is the foundation of our peace. In Ireland, many, many people are finding that peace is eluding them. All over the world, and now in Ireland also, the greatest problem among young people is anxiety. That's what they're experiencing. It's a generalized anxiety. It's a fear. They don't know what they're afraid of, but they're experiencing a fear. What the church has to offer to, uh, to the Ireland of today is that sense of the presence of God that takes away all our fear. And when, when the church in Ireland becomes again a praying church, when we can put people in touch with God, that is our... That is our first role to, to make that connection between God and man. Uh, and when we, when we do that in a strong way, the church, the church strives. And, and again, that's what comes from Medjugorje, that constant call, pray, pray, pray.